My name is Steve Relbowski. I work at RCA Records, which is a division of the RCA Music Group, which is a Sony BMG record company. I am the Senior Vice President of Artists and Repertoire, ANR for short, and responsible for signing artists such as David Gray, The Strokes, The Kings of Leon, My Morning Jacket, Rachel Yamagata, Ray LaMontagne, the Kills, Ben Queller, um, Matt Pond, and uh, I think that's it. I started in college. I was the guy running the concert committee at uh, school, which was uh, Buffalo State University, and simultaneously was the music director of the college radio station and doing uh, writing for student newspaper and independent music publications, as well as managing um, a band uh, and playing music myself. So uh, college was kind of a springboard into the industry as I made numerous contacts at record companies, booking agencies, and management companies in college. And I was hired out of school uh, to be the tour manager for, uh, by a management company that was managing B-52s, Talking Heads. and So I got into the music industry first as a tour manager, um, professionally, having been a concert promoter and a music director and a journalist and a musician and a band manager in my high school and college days, and a disc jockey. So uh, from there, I went into artist management and had my own small company, roster of artists, that were signed to a few of the different major labels and uh, included among them were Tom Verlaine who was signed to Warner Brothers, the Plastics who were signed to Island Records and the Necessaries who were signed to Sire Records. This would have been in the early uh, 1980s and um, 1983 I was hired by EMI Records as an A&R guy in New York and um, worked there for nearly a year. First signing was a band called Jason and the Scorchers, or then called Jason and the Nashville Scorchers, and was offered a position at Columbia Records, then a CBS Records label in 1984. Um, Columbia Records for three years. Highlights include The Outfield, um, Def Jam uh, label, which I brought to CBS, and that included artists such as the Beastie Boys, LL Cool J, Public Enemy, and uh, many more. So worked very closely with that, those artists and kind of the early stages of hip hop joining mainstream kind of record company affiliation from there. Um, career path took me to California where I ran the a and department for A&M Records. My signing highlights include Soundgarden, Soul Asylum, Blues Traveler, the Neville Brothers, and um, from there back to New York where I worked at Electra Records and the A&R department and uh, functioned as the head of A&R there for a period of time as well. And uh, signing highlights there include Nancy Griffith, Ween, Anthrax, The Breeders, and from Electra. Uh, Arista Records for a brief period of time, and then Interscope Records, and now the last seven years at uh, RCA, uh, where the artists that I already mentioned are, you know, things that have been done on my watch since I've been here. So um, that's 23 plus years of A&R at a variety of different record companies, both as the head of the department and um, kind of doing my own doing my own thing so well the term itself really technically speaking a and r means artists and repertoire and up until a certain point where artists were really writing their own material it was the name given to the person responsible for signing the artist who most of the time was a vocalist and providing the songs or the repertoire for that vocalist. So the name itself is kind of, you know, since the kind of, 
you know, era when artists became, you know, were writing their own material and become archaic, but it's just kind of stuck. So, you know, before I was doing it, long before I was doing it, it had changed from being a vocalist dominated, you know, artist roster to being a roster or label artist community made up of people that wrote their own material. Um, so my, you know, the time that I, and since the time that I've been doing, it seems like companies, there's less of head of A&R at company. It's more like president functions as head of A&R and individual A&R people are empowered to make decisions up to a certain point. When I started doing it, there was a, ha a, a, a person whose job it was to oversee specifically the A&R people and uh, that person then reported to the president of the company. It seems to be more now, whereas um, the head of the company acts as the final arbiter of the signing decisions and has a combination of scouts and experienced, record-making, savvy A&R people um, in the mix. I think also you've got more, uh, more tools for research you know, more indexes, more, you know, online communities, more web-based research tools available for discovery than certainly uh, would have been around when I started. And uh, I think speed of information is, you know, a lot more a factor these days than it was when I started. Um, just, you know, the more the, there's just a broader resource availability than than there might have been uh, then. And, uh, you know, at the same time, the economics resulting from declining sales of recorded music have also made, you know, the signing costs, you know, it's had an impact on how many deals are done, uh, how long a company stays committed to an artist, and how much financial resources applied to trying to break those signings through, you know, less signings, less time, less money um, to, to hang in there. You know, used, when I started, it was sort of almost a given that you'd, you'd certainly get to make two records and probably a third, come what may. You'd certainly get a second single, if not a third single, released from every record that you put out. And these days, it's kind of a w one record at a time, one single cycle at a time before the company decides if they're going to going to kind of continue or not. Also, I think up until maybe five or six years ago, multiple labels interested in a band would kind of spend whatever it took to get the deal done. And I think a lot of people got, you know, burned enough times in these kind of bidding war situations to be a little more cautious about it, even if it was something that a lot of people seem to, to want to do. So those are some examples of how it's it's different now than it was 20 plus years ago or different now than it was even five years ago. It's kind of uh, on the entry level. It can be research in terms of regionally developing artists and their building fan base, uh, web-based, you know, uh, information to provide sort of, you know, developing stories um, scouting, going out at night to see bands. You work in New York or LA where all the major companies are headquartered. You're going to see a certain level of A&R person out just kind of checking out two or three shows at night at the request of artist managers, music lawyers, music publishers, uh, at the direction of more senior members of A&R staff. You know, up the ladder a little bit, you know, you're your your positioning and hopefully signing artists that you're excited about that you think can do well that you have a vision and a plan for and uh, you are working with maybe the senior most people in the department to try and cast the recording scenario with respect to producers engineers mixers if outside writers or collaborators need be part of it that that element too and so you you kind of gain enough experience over time that you're able to kind of comfortably look 
to the producer, engineer, mixer community and make those casting calls, you know, maybe have three or four or five, you know, meetings with different candidates for your project, review uh, the songs that the artist would write and record in some kind of demo fashion, discuss which songs would be recorded for, for the record, who best to record, produce, studio, best location to record. And, you know, then, you know, sort of at the top of the food chain, you know, there may be a, a head of A&R, although I think that's sort of less and less these days, but uh, there may be a kind of a senior most person in the department that acts as a filter for the president of the company that helps to manage the flow of any number of A&R people within a company, either pitching to get a group signed or looking for, you know, input, and feedback, oversight on making of the record. And, you know, some people's role extends into once the project is signed, finished, you know, recorded and delivered and hopefully has everybody enthusiastic to then kind of be a bit of the shepherd, a bit of the kind of a bit of an internal manager for the project, a bit of a, you know, sort of a combination of enthusiast and game plan overseer, you know, helping the artist managers with their relationships with the company, making a proper introduction, presentation of the music and the artist if it's a, if it's a new signing and, uh, you know, having that 12 month a year relationship with the artist and the manager where most of the rest of the company is kind of their time is built into what the release schedule for the current project is. So, um, you know, some people are more successful or more comfortable being involved in the marketing of the records after they're done. Some people, it's a purely creative endeavor and they hand it over to, you know, the marketing department, the artist development department, promotion department, et cetera, to kind of figure out the plan for selling, you know, bringing the, bringing the music to, to the public. Um, you know, myself, I've always kind of felt like I wanted to manage the fruits of all that hard work. So that's, you know, that's me, but it's not everybody. You know, some guys are, some A&R people, you know, they like to spend a lot of time in the studio, you know, and that's really where they're the most comfortable to kind of sit around and respond to producer, artist, what do you think about this? you know, kind of particular creative issue and some people, you know, kind of want to get updates every few weeks and on how their records are going. And so everybody's got a little bit of a different sense of style and every company's got a little bit it, relating to the question about what people do and don't do within a company. I mean, some companies are more territorial than others about what that a &R, what A&R's role should be after the music is is delivered. So you kind of have to find a to find a balance, but you know, I've always felt that you're kind of making these little movies that you should, you know, have a hand in how they're presented, you know. It's a broad network and after building up, you know, uh, a broad, you know, realm of contacts over, you know, many years of of doing it, it really can come from anywhere. It can come from a manager, it could come from an artist. I find that the best suggestions are usually the ones that come from our other artists, you know, where, you know, um, an artist that I work with tells me about another artist that they've heard of. And those are the, those are the ones that, you know, I often find to be very rewarding. Um, it can be agents and music publishers and attorneys and, uh, you know, internal scouts that, you know, you hire to basically provide you, you know, early information on new and developing artists. It can be music publications. Uh, certainly, you know, there's a lot of web-based resources um, as well. And basically, it, you know, I think it's a lot of it just kind of comes, it just comes at you because it's, a, it's, it's become a smaller community of A&R people as co companies have consolidated, have merged and come together and consolidated. You know, you can, you know, you can go, you know, as a manager or an artist looking to get their music heard, you get your hands on the list of who's who at record companies and that, you know, what, that, what projects they work with and you can kind of get a sense of where they're, 
where their musical, you know, interest lies and pinpoint it and it kind of comes to you. I've always listened. It's, I've always, you know, felt that I have a responsibility to listen to everything that's come my way. A lot of companies have policies with unsolicited material and I just feel like if somebody's gone through the trouble of tracking me down and getting me music, I want to, I want to listen to it. But it's a, it's a broad, broad network of, you know, looking at a trade publication and, you know, ordering 20 or 30 records that might be on independent labels from a college radio airplay chart to, uh, internal scouts to, you know, managers that I've built contacts with over the years. All, all different places it comes from. Well, it makes information a lot more readily available. You can uh, instantly get a sense of what the artist's touring history is, what their local following's about, how they visually represent themselves. Artist web pages and MySpace pages in the current realm um, you know, give you instant, it, full full spectrum instant information, whereas you know, pre internet, you know, you'd have to rely on a press kit or, you know, kind of getting on a plane if you were that committed to go and see a show or meet people. Now you can really develop a quick take on the band's personality, their sense of style, their sense of taste by how they represent themselves um, in their own you know, web environments, you can get all manner of information on the, the, the story so far. You can listen to their music instantly. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to kind of wait on your music being put in the mail or sent to you two or three days later. It's just, it's a much more rapid availability of information and uh, the it's, and the ease of it is just, you know, it's all right there. At your fingertips, so just it speeds the information and discovery process greatly. And I think, um, you know, people through the web, you know, will email their music, and that's something that I see even even more in the very current climate is that people, rather than burning a CD and sending a CD or sending an MP3. And uh, I have everything go on an iPod instead of carrying around, you know, it used to be bags of vinyl, you know, shoulder bags of vinyl records. Then it was shoulder bags of cassettes, and then it was shoulder bags of CDs, and now everything's on one little iPod, you know, that is mobile and plugs into car or home stereo or headset or, or whatever. So, But uh, the web has definitely made access... Um, uh, to information, you know, a lot more speedily, readily available. Well, it's different, you know, it's really different in every case. And it can be in the very rare instances of, you know, well-recommended uh, from trusted contacts, office performance and instant, this is something that has to be done, let's do it you know, which has happened. It can come from, you know, there's something here, but not convinced on the first go around with respect to live performance, let's go another time and still not convinced, but other friends may say, you know, trusted friends may say, you gotta, you gotta keep, you know, you gotta keep thinking about this. And then, you know, a third time or a fourth time maybe does the trick. So it can be impulsive. It can be really thought through. It can be, I'm not sure, but maybe here's a little bit of seed money to just keep record, to keep writing and keep recording and keep coming back to me with new songs. And if the quality of the songs continues to evolve uh, to a point where there's now an undeniable you know, reason to, to sign uh, an artist, it can go that way. Um, there are some things that you know that you just you know and you just you will not be denied whether it's your boss or any you know the world at large you just have to have to have to have to have it and then there's other things where you know you want to have some feedback from colleagues you want to have you know people you know there at the at the beginning with you that might work in other areas of the company 
whose instincts you trust, that you might want to say, you know, what is your take? And come out to a show with me. What do you think? And it might help push you over the edge if you're just not sure about one particular aspect or another, you know. So you have to be careful when you're looking for consensus or when you're looking for even a small community of people because, you know, the opinion that you don't want is going to be the opinion of record. You know what I mean? It's like if somebody says, I'm not sure, it might make you say, well, you know, it might, it might make you say, why aren't you sure? You know, I, I want you to be sure, but if they're not sure, then you're almost better off to not have asked in the beginning because then it can kind of make you think, you know, get you confused about it. So it works in all different, it works in all 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 different ways, really. You know, it can be studied, it can be impulsive, it can be community, it can be singular. Everything just takes on its own set of circumstances. Well, usually, I mean, every company is different, but, you know, everybody has somebody that is a boss to them, and you go and you kind of lay it out, and you make a compelling presentation, and for someone like myself it's who's been doing it for a long time, uh, it usually goes from there to, you know, let's see what kind of a contractual proposal the representatives of the artists would put together and it goes into kind of a, a discussion uh, with company representatives and artist representatives to try to you know come to commercial terms uh, for a recording agreement for me it's really you know is there a commitment to absolute kind of you know the being the best that they can be, that there's an absolute dedication to the hard work that's required, um, that there's a commitment to, to doing something unique, that there's a kind of an X factor to the charisma, just something that you, it's either there or it's not there. And you should never talk yourself into thinking that it's going to be there. You know, the often this sort of X factor or it thing, this aura, whatever it is, precedes the songwriting development or the musicianship development. But, you know, that's the thing that you can't go to school for. You know, that's just something that some people are born with and most people aren't. You know, you can't, you cannot make it up or design it or go learn it somewhere. Um a unique a unique character in the singer's voice it's always something that i think stands people apart um intelligence um an emotional impact in lyric writing you know an ability to perform emotively if not perfect perfectly you know musicianship wise um i always get i always get you know, kind of a twinkle of people that are just a little irreverent with the system and the way things are meant to be. That's always something that kind of appeals to me. Um, and a timelessness to what the music is as opposed to a trendiness or, or, a, or a sort of fungibleness. You know, this is something that could have worked 50 years ago or 50, 50 years from now. Those are Those are the qualities that I look to you know it's nice to know that there's a local story but that doesn't always travel you know um and uh just the the, you know, the willingness to sort of separate the work from the hobby you know and that it it's something that you know you're gonna you have to live in you have to live in pretty um challenging conditions financially and be willing to to kind of do that and also be willing to do the work yourself up front, not just sort of be completely dependent on a company or your manager to kind of do it all. And, you know, you're just going to kind of write songs, show up and play gigs and go to recording studio. But that you're not afraid to call other bands to put shows together or, you know, just make stuff happen on your own. You know, that's that's an important quality too. So that's a lot. I mean, that's a that's why, you know, you, you start to, to, to sort of go through all the criteria and you can, by the time you get through the end of that list, it describes something that doesn't come around very often. Well, I think it gives the developing artists less of an opportunity because you've got companies combining their rosters, combining their staff, you know, 
it's harder for you know it's harder for people to have a long career trajectory a long a long a longer career path um and uh it, it, the currently successful top line artists are the ones that are going to get continued attention and uh the developing artists are going to have a harder a harder time of it uh, so uh it's survivalism on the corporate level uh, companies feel that they need to join forces with their former competitors to have enough of a market share to continue to have the stock price that the corporate parent company needs to keep its investors happy and and in the middle you've got you know an artist community that feels like they maybe aren't being supported for a long a long enough period of time to break them through and at the bottom you've got new signings that you know are trying to make extremely competitive records so that they can you know compete within their own family uh, shrinking CD sales and slow to make up the gap digital sales are at this particular po po point in time you know conditionally speaking kind of driving the notion of m merger necessity and all that comes from that with respect to shrinking staffs and shrinking spends and shrinking signings as well so um, one side of the coin is the best the best people survive and the other side of the coin is that the baby goes out with the bathwater a little bit too so you know uh, what what hasn't happened which was a kind of a prediction that that this would all give rise to a new level of you know mid, kind of a mid mid level of uh, you know or bigger bigger independent companies kind of you know coming into it but it doesn't seem to really have you know been the case you know you have to live it you have to believe it you have to have a really you know really work hard it's got to be you know distinctive you have to write and sing and play very well and you have to be willing to you know keep at it and you know it's better i think to kind of develop outside the spotlight until you know your body of work is as strong and your performing ability is as confident as it can be um, because once that first impression is felt it's very difficult to get a second opportunity to make that sort of first impression or turn around a bad first impression um, so uh, you know don't don't talk yourself into something, you know, that's really B plus. Don't try to tell yourself it's A and just, you know, realize that you've chosen an endeavor that has a tremendously high rate of failure. And um, you just really have to, like, do this because you feel like it's a calling or you just... You, you can't do anything else or, you know, it chose you, you know, kind of thing. And X Factor isn't something that you can practice. And uh, very, 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 very few people get to be a combination of talented and successful. So be honest with yourself. Developing outside of the major cities of New York and LA is probably a good thing to do uh, to get a local following where you can be playing for you know receptive attuned fans where you can get honest feedback on new material develop a clear sense of what the best of your material is uh, develop your regional touring outside of just your hometown to try to get pockets of fans so that when you do get signed there is a pre-built even on a microcosm level awareness for you to develop your web strategies with respect to your home page and your myspace page and um, just uh, you know try to develop a sense of what music writers 
around the country for national publications or major major city daily newspapers where their taste tends to lie and maybe surgically kind of pinpoint a few of those people make sure that the way that you visually represent yourself is extremely well thought through and developed that um i think the, the way that people sort of you know stylistically or visually present themselves whether it's you know high style or you know low style just a develop you know like a developed kind of visual presentation i think is very important in terms of catching someone's attention and then it just gets back to the basics are is that voice really distinctive are these songs do these can these songs take your breath away you know is this one of those one in a million things you know because it's that's kind of what it what it really does come down to different people think differently about the criteria certainly i'm just giving you kind of some of what what i what mine are it's a very challenging field there are fewer opportunities in the major label level um it's very competitive uh once you're inside and uh, at a company and um I don't know that if I was 25 today, which is the age I was when I was offered my first job, I would look at it the same way. Um, it seems that a lot of people getting started in A&R today reach a sort of an artificial ceiling where they basically have been scouts or information providers to people above them who make the signing decisions and make the record-making decisions. Um, and it's frustrating. Uh, it seems that the mentorship that existed when I started in terms of learning about producers and mixers and studios and doesn't seem to be there so much, you know, anymore. It's, it's become kind of a top-heavy A&R decision-making at the top level of the company. And a lot of the A&R departments are kind of for one reason or another, for one name or another, basically scouts, you know. So it's hard to kind of grow from being an information provider into a record maker, much less a, a, a manager of your project destiny. Uh, after all the all the recording part is done, but it's it's a it's a challenging uh, a challenging business, and you know it's almost a lot of the same advice that you asked me to or you know that i talked about giving to an artist it's a lot of the same advice about you know being on the other side of the equation and in the a and r in the a and r realm you know it's often who you know you know which is not something that you can make happen if you if you don't know i think you know any kind of college background in music or the arts with hands-on experience Concerts, radio, publications, use those experiences to get introductions to people, make a clear presentation of yourself, live and breathe and sleep and eat the music 24-7, learn the history of the music, learn the traditions of the music, just immerse yourself in an education process so that when you are afforded the opportunity to talk to someone that you can, you know, evidence a... Uh, an ex, you know, an awareness of what, where it all kind of came from and how it all kind of fits together. And just, it's like a, a live and live and die music kind of, you know, thing. It's, it's not for the hobbyist. It really has to be for the people that just have to do this. It's like I said before, some kind of a crazy calling and, uh, you know, just be out seeing music, be in, the smaller record stores discovering staff recommends you know from a listening post read the more astute online publications and printed publications and uh, just be an ongoing everyday student of of the music and the culture and the lifestyle and you know it doesn't hurt to have good taste and uh, you know um, but you've got to try to find a way to get networked into uh, someone's contact 
list or get a meeting, you know, and that's, a, that's, that's the random and difficult part of it. My way in was the college experience. For many people, it was the college experience that led them through college radio to some college department at a major record company or someone's concert experience in college led them into a booking agency or, you know, work with a management company. And then from there, it's just, you know, that making yourself well thought of by doing good work, showing good taste, having, you know, the right personality and um, being able to work hard and put the time in and be a likable sort of person who really knows their music.